can introduce you to uh, Carl Reed, who's the CTO for Open Geospatial, or well, Open Geospatial uh, Consortium. And um, and Carl, if you would like, you can go ahead and take it from here. Okay. Well, thanks for uh, giving the OGC the opportunity to uh, brief the uh, New York State GIS Association. Uh, we appreciate the opportunity, and thank you for joining this webinar. Um, just a little bit about who I am. I've been in the geospatial technology industry uh, for a really long time. Did my first computer map in 1969, uh, back when I was at university. I wear many different hats in the OGC. Uh, we're a virtual organization. Uh, we have about 24 employees. Uh, all of us do many have many different responsibilities and roles, but I'm the chief technology officer, the executive director of the standards program, technical committee chair, OGC architecture board chair, and the planning committee uh, chair. I have my PhD in GIS uh, from SUNY Buffalo. I did work on systems architectures uh, as part of my PhD activity, mostly in the area of uh, police information systems. And then I went to work for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, then Autometric, then Genesis, then Intergraph, and I joined the OGC in 2000 as a full-time employee. So standards. Uh, most people think that standards works really slow and boring and so on. Uh, actually, it couldn't be further from the truth. Uh, at least in the OGC, it's a very dynamic organization, very collaborative, very collegial, and there are a lot of extremely bright people representing uh, hundreds of different organizations that are involved in standards work. And what keeps it exciting is that the standards work we do, uh, number one, is extremely relevant in terms of enhancing our ability to share geospatial information and services. And a lot of the real world implementations of OGC standards have had significant impacts in a variety of different domains. And I'll be touching on that um, as part of this presentation. Also, um, the work is intellectually challenging because we work in so many different domains with so many different requirements and use cases. Uh, we find that there's a huge breadth of uh, knowledge that is shared within within the OGC. And a lot of people ask, you know, what is the value of membership? Well, one of the values of membership is this knowledge sharing, the ability to stay in touch with your peers, not just within your community, but many different communities, and to network and share information and requirements and knowledge that then lead to a much stronger collaboration and the development of our standards. A bit about the OGC. <clears throat> This is our mission. We serve as a global forum for the development, promotion, and harmonization of open and freely available geospatial standards. Uh, we are international. Uh, we have 475 plus member organizations and growing. The pie chart shows the distribution of our membership at this point. It changes slightly over time as members join and members leave for different reasons. But uh, we were founded in 1994. The original mission was to look at the issue of data sharing. There were huge issues in the mid 90s that inhibited the ability to share geospatial information across organizations. And that was the original reason for uh, the formation of the OG, OGC. Since then, we've gone beyond just data sharing at the GIS level, but have uh, gotten into many, many other um, domains and information communities that deal with the uh, use of location information. Since 94, uh, we've approved 38 uh, standards and there are a variety of best practices that also go along with those standards. There are currently thousands of product and application implementations of OGC standards. Uh, this group may be using OGC standards and don't even know it. That's one of the beauties of a good standard is it's there being used and people don't know about it. We have a very broad user community and obviously uh, location, geography is highly relevant 
in many, many different uh, realms, different domains, different communities. So we have alliances and collaboration activities with about uh, 40 different professional organizations. Some of them are standards organizations, others are organizations that look at how to implement standards within their communities. So what is interoperability? It's the ability of diverse sources and systems and organizations to work together, interoperate. Uh, obviously, as stated in our mission, it's all about easing information sharing, promoting information reuse. Um, obviously, it's very expensive to collect geospatial information. The more you can reuse it for and repurpose it for different applications and communities, the greater the value. We look at reducing duplication, improving quality, and enhancing the flexibility to add new capabilities. And above all, we are vendor neutral. At the end of the day, uh, and it's been documented uh, by many different organizations, the implementation and use of standards can save time, reduce costs, increase market choice, and probably most importantly, uh, protect assets and save lives. The OGC, again, is about enabling location integration within and across domains. And uh, as you'll see in the presentation today, we work with many, many different communities, many different domains, um, including these. We have very active what we call domain working groups in the OGC uh, that deal with hydrology, meteorology, oceanography, aviation. I'm not going to read the entire list, but you can see that the OGC um, deals with many, many different domains. And the reason for working with these different domains is every one of these groups has uh, semantic challenges or uh, geospatial data and service integration and interoperability requirements that may be a bit different from other communities, but at the same time, they also have many common requirements. So obviously one challenge we have in the OGC is getting all these different domain working groups to talk to each other to make sure that common requirements are expressed uh, within our standards, but at the same time, the domain specific interoperability requirements are also met. So for example, in the hydrology, community. Um, hydrologists need to display and present and visualize um, various types of water data. And that's a common requirement across all these domains. Everybody has a requirement to visualize. However, within hydrology, they have some very specific requirements for, say, how do you visualize a hydrological rate and discharge chart? So they look at specific requirements of visualizing their data uh, that has some very unique characteristics. And the same is true with all these different groups. As I mentioned before, we deal with uh, geospatial interoperability in many different domains. So we need to also work with alliance partners in these different domains to make sure that location or ge geographic data and services are consistently expressed and used across uh, these different organizations. I spend uh, some part of my time actually working with other standards organizations that have requirements for expressing location and sharing location information. And uh, it's uh, th these, these relationships are extremely valuable because Abi domain, uh, for example, I don't know if it's up here, but we are now doing a lot of work with the um, oil and gas community. Uh, they obviously are very geospatially intensive, but the OGC doesn't have a whole lot of geophysicists and geochemists and things like that um, representing us. So we have the geospatial expertise, the uh, oil community has the in-depth expertise on uh, upstream and downstream issues related to the use of location information. So we collaborate on how to best use uh, OGC standards within the oil and gas community. So we have a number of relationships with folks 
in the oil patch. And the same, say, with building. And we have a lot of activities going on right now with uh, various organizations that deal with buildings. It could be indoor location and navigation. It could be how do you move geospatial content through the built environment uh, workflow and life cycle from inception to maintenance. Uh, so we have many, um, as you can see on this screen, relationships with groups within the building and construction industry. And the same with all these other, other groups. So how do we define open? That's always an interesting issue. Uh, you hear the term open APIs a lot uh, out there. It seems like everybody has an open API. Actually, they're not open. Uh, they're only freely accessible, but they're controlled by a single vendor. Therefore, they're not open um, in our context. In our context, anything that's open is freely and publicly available, unencumbered by patents and other intellectual property. This is a big uh, uh, difference between what the OGC provides and, say, what Facebook or Twitter would provide with their so-called open APIs. They own all the intellectual property. In the OGC, any organization, a group of organizations that submit technology for consideration as a standard in the OGC has to turn all the intellectual property over to the OGC for the good and benefit of the global uh, community. Everything we do is non-discriminatory, which means anybody anywhere can download and use OGC standards. There are no license fees. They are vendor neutral. Uh, the majority of our standards are data neutral unless they're a um, content model specific to a given domain. Everything we do is agreed to in a formal consensus process. Uh, the consensus process is guided by well-defined, member-approved, and developed policies and procedures. And you'll see this word consensus show up over and over. And no single entity can control the standard. It's a, everything we do is by consensus, it's collaborative, it's collegial, and there are a lot of rules in our policies about things like balance of interest and antitrust and making sure that everything we do is a group decision and not controlled by a single entity. And open standards do not mean open source. Uh, that's sometimes a confusion. Uh, the open source community makes heavy use of OGC standards and we collaborate very closely with them. But an open standard uh, and open source are two different things. So what's an OGC standard? It's a document established by consensus and approved by the membership that provides rules aimed at an optimum degree of interoperability. And typically, the way uh, any standard starts in the OGC, there's a set of community requirements, and member requirements, and a variety of trends that shape what the rules and what the guidelines will be that are documented in the given standard. So because we're international, because we have many different communities, because we have many different organizations uh, with potentially different requirements or business needs or business objectives, uh, standards development is not necessarily easy. And uh, it requires a certain amount of give and take and requires a certified repeatable process. But if you don't have standards, there are potentially huge costs. Uh, NIST, which is a US uh, government organization, did an analysis of the costs of lack of interoperability in the building industry and found that in 2002, so 12 years ago, it was costing the US about $16 billion in capital costs uh, because they didn't have a good approach to interoperability of data moving through the construction lifecycle workflow. So some information on key OGC standards. Uh, you may have heard of some of these. I don't know how familiar you are with the OGC, but we have a variety of web service standards. Uh, for cataloging and discovery, for visualization, for data access, uh, for data encoding. Probably the one you've all heard of is KML. Uh, that's an OGC standard. Uh, you may have heard of also web map service. Those are fairly 
widely implemented uh, in geoportals and a variety of GIS applications. Digging in a little deeper on a few of the standards, uh, the OGC Web Map Service was the first OGC uh, standard, web service standard. Uh, was published in 1999, still around, still heavily used. Uh, there, as far as we know, uh, about 10,000 or so implementations and portals and applications and GIS vendor products of Web Map Service. Um, it's uh, heavily used because it's easy to implement. Uh, implemented properly is extremely efficient, very low overhead, and uh, it's available from all GIS vendors, which makes it which makes it uh, nice in terms of interoperability. And it just simply says, uh, okay, geospatial repository or GIS database. Uh, here's my area of interest, and I want transportation displayed on the screen this way. And it's a very simple request response type interface. A little more uh, sophisticated because it actually returns data is something called Web Feature Service. And again, Bo, it's a request response and the request, request could be uh, give me uh, parcels in this geographic area and return them to me as a, in geography markup language using a particular content model. So this is, uh, allows a client to actually request the physical data and have it streamed or packaged and sent to a you know, client for further use, say, say an update activity. And here's an example of using uh, OGC Web Map Service and Web Feature Service uh, by the USDA Forest Service. Their fire, they have a fire data web service suite where you can go in and look at all the hotspots and current fire activity and potential hotspots. And it's using um, OGC Web Map Service and Web Feature Service as part of their implementation. An area we got to very, into very heavily in 2000, and it's an ongoing activity in the OGC, is sensors. And you might ask, uh, why is the OGC in sensors? Well, sensors have location. Um, and whether they're uh, moving, dynamic, it's like, like a satellite or a drone, or they're fixed or in C2, they all have location, they're constantly expressing their locations, and the vast majority of sensor observations out there will have some sort of a location attribute. So the OGC community and um, the majority of the satellite vendors, such as NASA or Digital Globe or Orbital Image, are all OGC members. And they had real needs for consistently describing a sensor, tasking the sensor, and accessing uh, sensor observation. So that's why we have this suite of uh, web service accessible standards for sensors. And a number of these now have restful instances um, so that it's not just a traditional HTTP request. You can actually have a RESTful instance of these. Oh, I should say these are also now evolving into uh, very lightweight encodings and requests for use in the Internet of Things. So here's an example of the use of our sensor standards in something called, uh, well, two, got two different ones here. One is uh, NOAA's uh, Ocean Observation System makes heavy use of OGC standards for access, uh, visualization, and um, archiving and discovery. And also something called the German Indonesian Tsunami Early Warning System makes heavy use of the OGC standards, uh, including all the, the sensor standards, as part of an early warning system for tsunamis in the Asian area. Sorry about my dog in the background. <laughs> my granddaughter just showed up. Um, a newer standard that's been getting a lot of uh, use lately is something called Web Processing Service. 
So once you know about the data that you want, uh, you may wish to do some heavy analysis, or you may have some geospatial analytics that you wish to um, process against the data, but you want to do it through a standard interface. You don't want to do it through a vendor-specific protocol. Well, you can wrap that geospatial service in something called the OGC Web Processing Service and uh, then use a standard uh, request response for doing your analytics, like your polygon overlay, or buffering, or networking. Uh, web Processing Service, uh, the open source community, for example, has wrapped every single function in GRASS, which is an open source um, raster processing satellite data processing system. It's been around forever. Well, everything's available through a web processing service request. So if you put all of this together, you can deploy sophisticated systems. This is a real-time debris flow monitoring and simulation and alerting system in Taiwan. They use the OGC um, sensor web standards. They use web processing service to wrap all of their uh, grid processing and simulation um, analytics in a, in a common uh, way using WPS. And then they also use a variety of standards for alerting. Um, in Taiwan, uh, Taiwan has very, very rugged terrain. Something like 80% of the country is mountainous. And when they get a typhoon, they have problems with something called debris flows, which are extremely deadly. So they need to monitor a whole variety of different uh, properties or, or attributes, such as uh, rainfall, uh, stresses in the uh, land. And these all feed into a simulation system. And if certain thresholds are met, they send out alerts to people within a given geographic area to let them know that they need to um, evacuate. Uh, KML, I mentioned before, uh, KML is an OGC standard for visualizing, providing visualization rules and geometries for visualization of 2D and 3D uh, information, primarily for with browser systems. Uh, KML is not a data exchange or geospatial modeling language. Uh, instead, you probably want to use something like the OGC geography markup language. A really new um, OGC standard is something called GeoPackage. GeoPackage is a lightweight uh, mechanism for taking data from your geospatial repositories, packaging it up, downloading it to your mobile device, and then taking that mobile device out into the field, maybe being disconnected or offline, doing whatever you need to do out in the field, and then bringing the information back and uploading it to transact changes to your um, geospatial repositories. Uh, the requirements for this came out of two major communities. One was the emergency response community, and the other was um, the uh, field forces in the, in the military, or uh, the ability to get all the information they need easily uploaded to a mobile device, disconnect, go out in the field, do what they needed to do, and then bring bring it back, connect it back to you online, and then transact your changes. So this is just uh, showing that OGC standards are designed to work together. Uh, some of the applications that I showed already require the interaction of multiple OGC standards from different vendors. Uh, this particular example here has to do with the visualization of 3D data from taking data from many different sources through from many different vendors and then being able to render that 3D data on any number of different devices. This is part of an ongoing activity in the OGC right now to define a web 3D uh, interface, much like the web map service, except for 3D content. And the idea is to be able to support complete workflows. In this case, we're looking at the building industry. 
where you're doing uh, initial demand conceptualization for say a new uh, building and you want to be able to move the content all the way through up to construction and maintenance and that just requires the use of uh, data from many vendors many sources and the integration and use can be enhanced by the use of OGC standards so now let's look at data models I've mentioned that a number of times from the OGC perspective, data models are about describing objects together with their properties and relationships that are typically real world objects such as streets, properties, utility lines, buildings, things we're all used to. In the standards world, a data model typically represents an agreement within an information community or domain. And these agreements include the semantics, relationships, vocabularies, and other elements required to ensure the full understanding of the content contained in a package of data supplied to you. So the OGC um, initially looked at how do you encode any data model, regardless of where it comes from. And we needed to think about the vendor neutral we're not really into storage formats. Um, any encoding that we need to come up with or data models need to be technology agnostic. They need to be self-describing. And they need to be agreed to attained by some international organization. And um, to ensure consensus. Um, so if you look at a lighthouse, for example, well, we may think of this as a lighthouse, but actually, depending on what community you're in, you've got a different view of what this thing is. From an airplane, it's a vertical obstruction. For others, it's an observation post. For sailors, it's a navigation beacon. I think of it as a lighthouse when I look at it. So different communities can look at the same object and have different meanings or semantics related to that object. So what data models do is to define what this and other objects are within your particular domain so that you can more effectively share the content within the domain. So the OGC, as I mentioned, had to come up with a mechanism for sharing any data model for any community and we came up with something called the geography markup language. And it's an XML grammar for sharing geographic, for encoding, modeling, and sharing geographic information. It's uh, now an ISO standard also, but it is data model neutral, vendor neutral, so that any data model developed by any community that has location elements can be um, encoded and shared using the geography markup language. So here's some examples. Uh, the German community years ago came up with a model for sharing 3D urban uh, data, what they call urban models. And this was encoded in GML and became an OGC standard called City GML. And the building renderings you see on this page are all rendered using and shared using City GML. At this point, uh, in Germany and in the Netherlands and Austria and now in some of the Asian countries, it's become a national, essentially a national standard for sharing 3D urban information. It's starting to gain some interest here in the United States. Um, I think part of the issue is a lot of people don't know about it in the U.S., but it's supported uh, by a number of the GIS vendors support the ability to create city GML and ingest city GML um, encodings. So that's just one example, and it's used for a whole variety of different applications. A new standard that's just in an adoption vote right now is indoor GML. Uh, indoor GML is a model, it was originally developed as a data model to represent and exchange information related to a building for indoor navigation. And the encoding is called indoor GML. So they use GML to encode the data model, the shared understanding of the semantics related to a building for indoor navigation. That's a very complex problem. 
Um, I never knew it, but there are all kinds of things like pinch points and uh, where wide hallways become narrow hallways. And when you get into navigation, say for evacuation or an emergency, things like pinch points are extremely important. So they had to model that. They had to model elevators, stairways, uh, <laughs> all kinds of interesting uh, parts of an indoor environment. And, and then the uh, city GML, the outdoor folks, said, well, you know, you're a little inconsistent with what we're doing in outdoor space. So they had to get together uh, the indoor GML and city GML folks got together and came up with common semantics and, and encodings for uh, ensuring seamless navigation from outdoor to indoor and indoor to outdoor. So they modified their data models, their content models, which then obviously um, were reflected in changes to the actual encodings in GML. Another community that came up with a content model was were geologists and geophysicists. Uh, they had real issues of sharing geological structure, borehole and lithology information uh, for years. So about a dozen different geological, national geological organizations got together and came up with a content model for sharing uh, geological structure and borehole and morphology information. And they said, well, we need to encode it in something. So they encoded it in GML and something called observations and measurements and came up with something called GeoSciML, which is now an international standard for sharing uh, geological information. So again, the idea is that a community has an issue of sharing data. They get together, the experts in that community, and they define a content model that allows them to easily express the semantics and vocabularies used within their community. And then they decide on how to encode it. And a lot of them are encoding in GML um, because it's extremely expressive. Uh, but you could also encode the models in other, other things such as, as JSON. So it's not mandatory that these models be encoded in GML. It's just that a lot of systems uh, support GML, and GML is actually much more expressive for dealing with things like geometry uh, than something like JSON. Um, another data model is in the aviation industry. Uh, they have something called the Aeronautical Information Exchange Model. Again, the aviation community on a global basis got together and said, how do we share aeronautical information? Uh, like all of the runways for the different airports, and then how do we stream that up to the cockpit of an airplane? Um, and then render the runways in, in the cockpit of an airplane, recognizing bandwidth problems and things. And they came up with uh, AIXN. And then they said, well, we need to be able to encode this and they again decided to use the geography markup language, GML. And uh, then they also do binary encodings of GML so they can compact it and make sure they can stream it as necessary into the cockpit of airplanes. And then finally, weather. Everybody worries about weather. Every domain, almost every domain in one form or another has to deal with weather. So there's a emerging standard that's being worked with with the World Meteorological Organization, the aviation community, uh, the meteorology uh, organizations in different countries are all working on WXXM. And they have also decided uh, to encode this particular data model using geography markup language and something called observations and measurements, which is a standardized way of communicating and modeling observations and measurements. So that's a little bit about data modeling within the OGC context. And you can see I never mentioned a particular technology approach or vendor. And again, that's because the OGC, everything we do, uh, we try to remain vendor neutral, but meet the requirements of the vendor community. We also try to be technology as technology neutral as, as possible while at the same time meeting the requirements of both the user and technology development communities. So some sample uses of OGC standards. Uh, we've seen some already, just a few more. Uh, 
uh, we're getting, we've been following and tracking uh, smart, smart cities. A lot of companies are investing heavily in smart cities, but we're looking at how do you develop a framework for spatial intelligence within a city? And there are many, many different parts to that. Um, and we have developed uh, working relationships and liaison activities with our organizations that are also interested in smart cities. Uh, we're going to have to work with some other standards development organizations. But there's a whole suite of things. Uh, and at the core of a lot of this are sensors. So a lot of the work we're doing is looking at how do we integrate OGC sensor standards within the smart city infrastructure. And this is what's been driving a lot of the work in our, our making much more lightweight encodings and interfaces for our sensor standards to deal with the proliferation of sensors within an urban environment. This is a uh, application in Norway. It's a portal. It's a geo portal in, in Norway. Uh, it integrates 400 municipalities uh, or information from 400 municipalities. They tend to use different GIS software vendor systems. Uh, some are open source, some are commercial. Um, some use uh, Google, some don't, some use Esri, some don't. So there's a wide variety of technologies being used, and yet they wanted to create an integrated view of all the geospatial holdings for their spatial data infrastructure for the country of Norway. And they do this through the use of, a, of about a dozen different OGC standards. And they are also uh, compliant with something in Europe called INSPIRE, which is the pan-European uh, spatial data infrastructure uh, rules and guidelines for sharing geospatial content, modeling geospatial content across all of Europe. In the United States, uh, one of the early adopters of OGC standards was North Carolina. Um, there are 70 some counties in North Carolina. And when they first started looking at a, a statewide geoportal, they had five or six different GIS vendors, uh, but they wanted to create, from the end user's perspective, a single integrated view of their key foundation data sources across the state, like parcels, transportation, land cover. So they decided to use uh, web map service. And uh, here's an image just from a couple days ago from NC One Map. They're still using OGC web map service and a few other OGC standards as part of their portal because it allows you to easily create, from the user's perspective, a seamless view across the entire state of uh, their foundation data types, such as parcels, uh, independent of whatever GIS vendor or storage structures being used for the geospatial data. This is from Bahrain, uh, wildlife monitoring, bird, ac bird activity. Uh, they use OGC uh, standards in Bahrain for uh, visualization and sharing of content, not just in the country of Bahrain, but the surrounding uh, countries that they have to deal with uh, for wildlife management. This is in Germany. Uh, they're using OGC standards for sharing 3D urban information and feeding that into models to do solar potential analysis, where is the best place to put solar panels for optimum impact and uh, least cost. Another, another view of that here for, this is Hamburg, the previous one was Berlin. This is Australia. This is for water resources. They have a national, about five years ago, the government in Australia decided to invest a significant amount of money in excess of a billion dollars to put together a monitoring and um, infrastructure for a complete integrated Australian water resources information system. Water is a huge issue in Australia, as it is in much of the US now. So they've stood up a system uh, that uses 
uses many different technologies, but everything is tied together. And the glue that holds it all together is uh, the use of standards, not just OGC standards, but a variety of standards um, from a number of different organizations. And that's now operational. Some recent work in Europe, again, pan-European, in this case, the application area is health. It's a project called EO to Heaven, Earth Observation and Environmental Monitoring for the Mitigation of Health Risks. Um, this will complete, uh, I believe, in 2015 and become an operational system. And it's how do you take in sensor information uh, remotely sensed information, integrate it together, model it, and use it to provide a better understanding of the complex relationships between the, the environment and the impacts on human health. And it's uh, using a variety of uh, OGC standards to implement the infrastructure. And here's another environmental one. This is uh, it shows the city of Copenhagen, but it was actually also done, being used in uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts. And it's crowdsourcing uh, citizen sensing and sensor web technologies for environmental health. Uh, what they did in um, Cambridge is they mounted sensors on bicycles. And students, as they ride around from home to class or wherever they're riding their bikes, are constantly uh, monitoring air quality and particulates using the sensors not only on the bikes and all that information is fed into a, a data fusion and data analysis uh, something called common sense <laughs> and it and it allows you to generate in near real time a 3d image of different pollutants and particulates in these uh, cities and originally, it was done as uh, research just to show that you could do all of this, but uh, now people are looking at, at actual operational deployments. And a lot of this is about bringing everything together to do uh, modeling and total integration, uh, data fusion, and to use the term, but big data analytics. Uh, it's a hot topic to, in this case, we're bringing data in from many different sources, feeding it into a complex uh, modeling system in three space and including time to look at um, uh, distribution of energy in real time in three space as part of the Smart Cities initiative to provide input into uh, the decision support information necessary to provide much more energy efficient cities. And so what does this really all mean in terms of uh, standards and, and the value of standards? I mean, it's, it's good to be able to share information more effectively. It's, it's good not to worry about, uh, say, if there's a data model that exists for transportation or cadastral, it's nice to know those are available because it makes it easier to share information. But at the end of the day, what does this really all mean? Um, well, what, what the Germans have found, um, and they're big on doing studies and documenting, they, they, they sent out questionnaires to about 1,200 different organizations in Germany. They did it initially in 2000, then again in 2010, to look at the value of standards to an entire economy, and not just an individual organization, although much of what they found for the entire economy is germane to individual organizations. And they found that standardization leads to lower transaction costs in the economy as a whole, as well as savings to individual organizations. And that transaction costs drop considerably as a result of the standards since they make information available and are accessible to all interested parties. There's actually a fairly lengthy report that they published that's available uh, in English uh, on the DIN website. They also found that standards have a positive effect on the buying power of organizations. It helps organizations avoid dependence on a single supplier 
allows availability of standards, opens up the market, results in broader choice, and it also results in increased competition and increased market for suppliers, which is interesting. Organizations have increased confidence in the quality and reliability of suppliers who use standards, and those organizations can use standards to broaden their potential markets. So these are some of the things the Germans have found. Well, interestingly enough, other groups that have done similar studies, such as NASA <coughs> and um, ISO, have found exactly the same uh, benefits. Now, obviously, there are also costs in using standards. I don't have a slide on costs, but some of the costs that the number one cost is just a learning curve. Um, of using, a, of using a standard primarily for the software development community. Uh, if they've not used standards before and suddenly their customers say they use standard XYZ, they have a learning curve in terms of understanding that standard and implementing, implementing that standard in their software. And there's actually also a cost to the user community because if they're really going to express their requirements, uh, to their vendors, they need to understand the value of a particular standard in their uh, community. So, for example, if you're a geologist and you wish to use GSIML so that you can share geological structure information, not just say within the city, but also with the state and with a broader community such as USGS, uh, you need to be able to know that that standard exists. You need to be able to tell your vendor you want to use GeoSciML, and you need to give them the reasons why. So there is a cost. It's primarily in education and learning uh, the value of a particular standard within the context of uh, your requirements as a business or a government organization. So there are benefits and there are some costs. Uh, fortunately, the benefits uh, far outweigh the, the costs. So with that, I thank you. And there's an interesting quote from the founder of the OGC, David Shell. Interoperability seems to be about the integration information. What it's really about is the coordination of organizational behavior, which uh, actually gets to my, my last point is that the organization needs to understand their requirements and agree on their requirements before they can actually make recommendations as to which standards uh, are best suitable for the integration of information within the organization. So with that, I'll say um, thank you for listening. And uh, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. I know I threw a lot of information at you in a short period of time. Um, but hopefully um, you will be able to use this information to best use. Uh, the slides are available. You can share them all you want. There are no restrictions. Any questions? Channel um, that people can go on there and check it out again. And um, if anybody has any questions, uh, feel free to go ahead and enter those now in the chat yeah. system. We'll wait anybody for there? a couple minutes. And... Everybody's on mute. Uh, uh, yeah, Carl, yeah. Um, with, with this program, everybody's muted when they come in, and there's no way yeah. to really unmute them. So what we do is just use this chat log. It looks like um, there is a question that just came across from Mary here is, is, is there any groups working on US government standards for transportation? Lots of federal reporting could be simplified if there were standards. Uh, yeah. Um, in terms of transportation, I believe the FGDC has a content model for the transportation network. Um, we've actually in the OGC done work on how do you, because every state has their own uh, standard for encoding and sharing transportation information. So we actually did a project uh, funded by the US government and state of California and state of Oregon 
looking at how do you share transportation data across state boundaries. And it took some hard work because the folks at the state level needed to get together and agree on the semantics about what you know, simple things like what do they mean by a divided highway or what's uh, curb and what's gutter. So um, there's been some interesting work there on um, real time uh, schema tra translation and transformation. Uh, but that was, that was just to show proof of concept of how do you share transportation data in real time when you have different data models in different states. Uh, the FGDC, I believe, and NGA, actually, um, for their foundation data, they do have some We have another couple. Models. Yeah. Um, I had a question from and, Alex. Uh, and Alex, yes, we, we will make this available. Yes. And then I'm not sure we have another one here about um, is there an overview web page that tells us how to navigate the OGC <laughs> website to find out about A, the new OGC developments, such as including moving objects into the GPS as well as B, to the wonderful application examples you present? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, we're right in, in the middle. Every standards organization struggles with this, this one. We're right in the middle of a website redesign to actually do what Joaquin is asking for. Um, because right now you go to the splash page for the OGC, and it's a little hard sometimes to find what you're looking for. Um, I think the best thing to do is if we can capture uh, these questions, I can respond in more detail uh, to them to provide the links to say where to get to moving objects and uh, examples of all the uh, applications. There are a whole bunch of different presentations that are publicly available. Uh, in terms of Mary uh, asking about which group should I reach into, um, there's some people in the OGC, uh, like when it comes to the top of my head, because he worked on something called TransXML, which is a XML encoding for sharing transportation information, is Paul Scarpincini. Um, he's also the editor of the ISO standard for linear referencing, which also ties into transportation. So um, I, I think it'd be useful if we can capture the questions in the chat box, I can provide much more detailed information with links, uh, which may, might make it a little easier at this point, if that makes sense. And also, uh, there, Mary had another question, I think it was a follow-up question. She said, which group should I reach out to? This is related to, I think, the federal or the U.S. government standards for transportation. Carly's there. Hello, Carl? Yeah, I'm here. Oh, okay. Um, question said, which group should I reach out to? And that was related to the question you answered earlier about the U.S. government standards for transportation. Yeah, yeah. That was the... Um, if you're looking at the federal level, level and Mary's typing again, um, I, I know there's some FGDC. You're familiar with the FGDC, Federal Geographic Data Committee. Well, how do I contact? All right, yeah. Uh, there's my email address, the short form. Uh, if anybody has specific questions that we can't address today, uh, or if I need to do a little research to make sure I get you the right information, there's my email address. Feel free to email me anytime. Um, I'm usually pretty good at responding to email. Um, and, and Mary, that's probably the best way for me to give you specific information and contact names. And the same with Joaquin. Uh, okay. um, in terms of information that he might be interested in, in terms of moving objects and some of the application examples. 
because there's some really good uh, presentations uh, you might want to download and view it as leisure. And I just want to say, Carl, you know, thank you very much. And actually, you know, this applies to a lot of us, I think, um, having these standards. Um, I know with ourselves, we do a lot with a lot of different uh, local governments. And, mm -hmm. of course, each one kind of maintains their data in their own way. And sometimes trying to mesh that data together can be very difficult because it's not standardized. Um, so we're not using the same type of coding and that type of thing. So, you know, I... Definitely, we've talked about this internally very much about doing things like yeah. that where we set up a standard moving forward. So if, say we share a zoning file with another local government, it's going to match up with what they have and not be coded in a different way. So mm -hmm. um, yeah. I know we're working towards things like that. Yeah, there's some really interesting but, um, Things you can do if you if you have a standard content model, say for zoning, and everybody agrees to that content model, you don't have to actually change what you're doing at the local level. You can keep your format and vocabularies and everything, but you do what we call on the fly schema transformation. So obviously, there's some software in there that takes what you have at the local level and maps it into the statewide agreed to content model. So that the view that anybody else sees is the common model. Um, and that's what's going on in a lot of places right now. Um, so we know it can be done. It just takes um, an agreement between everybody as to what your actual shared model is going to be. <laughs> group here to the New York State Association and we uh, it's uh, seminars like these that, that really help uh, our organization and and we really appreciate it well thank you for the time and uh, everybody